Uh, unfortunately, my camera isn't working, but I'm Ken Duffy, uh, Council for Chair Council, and I'll be chairing tonight's meeting. We did have an agreement at previous board meeting that Aisha can would chair. Unfortunately, Aisha had a family bereavement and can't make it this evening. And I'm sure we can min it from our colleagues and friends here at the community board our condolences and thoughts with our family at this time. Matt, do we have any further apologies for this evening? Uh, Chair, I've got a list of apologies here. Um, we have apologies from Don Middleton um, from Motherwell Football Club. Um, Aisha, as you've mentioned, um, Nan McIntosh, um, Jim Dobby from the Tennis Federation and Anne Monroe, although Liz Ann McMurray is here representing her tonight. Thank you. Thanks very much. Agenda number three is the minutes of the previous meeting and matters arising from the meeting. Uh, it's just for approval from the board if it's a true and accurate minute. I'll take that as agreed. Oh, Council Adam. No, thanks. Agenda number four is the Interest from Fiona McCabe at Community Action New York Hill in the role of chair. Matt, do you just want to explain, you know, obviously we've got Aisha as well, how that will work uh, in a rotational basis? Sure, thanks, Chair. Yeah, just to uh, thank Fiona for her, her interest in the, in the chair going forward. What we're looking to do is a couple of people who have put their names forward for chairs. Hopefully, what we'll do is between Aisha and Fiona over the next couple of cycles, we have an opportunity to each chair the board. Um, going forward from the air, but we'll have discussions with ongoing discussions with Aisha and Fiona in relation to that. Chair, we'll pick that up after the after the meeting. Thanks, Matt. And I'm sure we're all agreed. And again, thanks to Fiona and others for putting their name forward to be more participating in the board. Agenda number five is driving digital locally. Lynn, are you going to take us through this agenda item? Good evening. Um, so I'm going to try. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Yep. I'm going to try and share my. Oh. And have I. Here am I. Oh. No, nope, that's not shared. And um, can everyone see that? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Okay, doc. So good evening, everyone. Thanks for welcoming me along to the Motherwell Community Board tonight. My name is Lynn Gow, and I am the new comms and engagement lead for Digital NL at North Lanarkshire Council. This is the tenth day in the jobs. So you might have to bear with me a bit tonight. So tonight I'm here to talk to you about the Council's digital agenda and explore your training and access needs and how we can work with you to address these. Please drop any questions into the, the chat bar and I'll happily pick them up at the end. So a key objective from the outset of the Council's dig digital NL project was community engagement and the engagement boards are crucial to this. As you're aware, the Council has established nine community boards across North Lanarkshire as part of our framework for working with communities. The board, the board provides a structure for local decision making, investment and accountability. And this board provides the best platform to begin our discussion about digital development and inclusion in Motherwell. So tonight is the start of that journey for us, and I'm going to outline the Council's digital ambitions and how we'll roll these out at a local level. But I'll also be asking for your help at the end, both in terms of promoting the benefits of digitisation and, and how to get involved amongst your group members, neighbours and family, but also to work with us in addressing the barriers to digital inclusion and how we ensure no one's left out or excluded. So to begin, let's look at the Council's progress so far. 
So as many of you will, will already know or have heard of the plan of North Lanarkshire, it's our strategic vision. The circles around the middle of your screen are our five key priorities, and we want to make North Lanarkshire a place to live, learn, work, invest and visit. We have individual programmes of work to make our ambition a reality. Now, the programmes of work you can see on the left hand side relate directly to our digital work streams and the programmes of work that you can see down the right hand side of the screen are further work streams that can be enhanced through digital ways of working. North Lanarkshire has an ambition to be the leading digital authority. So during the first design stages, we identified five key areas of work that you can see down the left hand side of your screen. In terms of the economy, we want to attract inward investment and expansion through improved connectivity and faster broadband access. We want to use digital technology to support people to live independently for longer in their own homes, for example, and to give peace of mind to family members through alerts, for example, if an elderly relative has fallen. We want to make it easier for you to contact the council online and at a time that suits you. We want our workforce to be digitally skilled using automation to free up resources, avoid duplication and allowing us to prioritise resources more effect efficiently. And lastly, we want to make smarter use of the data that is available to us to, to monitor trends and to make better informed decisions. You will see on the right hand side of your screen that some of the pictures are black and some of them are grey. The black ones highlight the work that is currently underway within the Council and the grey ones are the ones that are still to begin. So what does it all mean at a local level? Driving digitally locally means exactly what it says. It's about supporting our community. We know that one size doesn't fit all. We need to work with individual boards like you to help identify and meet your digital needs. We want to build digitally capable and confident communities to ensure that you can take advantage of any new job opportunities in the technology sector and to ensure that your children or young people are equipped and able to participate fully in digital learning. But we know it's not going to be easy. The stakeholder engagement around the local outcome improvement plans that you participated in before Christmas showed us that nine community boards identified digital inclusion as a priority. Six areas identified affordability as a concern and the need to ensure that people had broad digital skills was raised in six areas with a further three highlighting the importance of this for older people. And while it was recognised that opportunities like this, such as Teams and WebEx meetings, are great for involving wider audiences, there's a risk that people who are not digitally connected may be left out. So, so where are we now? This, this, this slide here highlights some of the work that we've carried out to date. Community board meetings are now being held remotely with over 300 attendees and approximately 1,100 live, stream, live streams or recording that have been viewed, allowing more people to participate. Through the Scottish Government's Connecting Scotland programme and our own education, we're distributing even more devices and connectivity solutions to ensure families who are living on a low income and vulnerable people can still engage. And we're looking at how we can improve connectivity through free Wi-Fi and affordability. So I said at the beginning of the presentation, I would have an ask of you. We're inviting you to get on board with us and helping to ensure our communities are digitally included, confident, capable and connected. Please encourage your groups to become more involved and support individuals if they're feeling excluded or they simply don't understand or are lacking digital confidence and signposting to our digital champions our community learning and development or our libraries when it's safe for them to reopen again. So most people have online bank accounts these days, shopping online. The council wants to move into that modern world, but people need an account to access council online services. And they can do this by creating a, a, a Scottish Government My Account. And we want you to encourage and help family members to sign up for this My Account. At the moment, the inquiry function is primarily related to waste, but we've recently added the COVID business grants and more services will come on board later on this year. 
And finally, from tonight's meeting, please think about whether you would have time to join our digital subgroup to work with us in shaping our digital agenda to ensure it meets your needs and aspirations for your friends and family. If you're interested at all in getting involved, please just leave your name in the chat bar or speak to Matt or even drop a message via our digital NL mailbox and it's digitalnl at northland.gov.uk and I'll pop this in the chat bar. Thanks very much for listening. Thanks, Lynn. That was really, really good. Does anybody have any comments or questions for Lynn? Yeah, yeah, on you go. Oh, I think you're on mute still. There you go. Oh, you get so excited because you get the opportunity. I forget about your. Okay, uh, my question is um, with regard to digital inclusion. I mean, that is most important for everyone. However, with regard to minority ethnic communities, there are some additional uh, problems there. So I was I was wondering if there has been any structure um, planned for people who, who will have totally different needs. Well, that's a really good question. And we're at the start of that um, that that phase just now where we're engaging with the community um, and that's what this is all about is finding out what your needs are and what we can do to support your needs. Okay, um, there was a, this survey uh, lately and the, the major problem, I mean, if, if you speak to uh, the coordinator and maybe she could even explain uh, what practical problems that uh, she faced are along with her, us, you know, who were helping the, uh, our, our members and the problems that we had. Um, and I'll be more than happy to um, talk to you. Okay, can I, I've just, I've taken your name and can I, could I come back Bush. to you about that? Yeah, yeah I can please. see it on the screen. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for that. And obviously we can note that Richard Bolton had said that you'd be happy to be on the, the subgroup as well. Don't see any further questions. So thanks for that again, Lynn. And I apologise for showing my notes. Uh, <laughs> I've just seen it. it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Easy done. <laughs> okay. agenda, item number, agenda item number six. Uh, Cheers. One. Sorry, Sorry. Can, I, can I interrupt Dennis O'Keefe had his hand up there? I apologise. I think he wanted Dennis. Hi, thanks very much for that. Um, I was usually in relation to joining the digital subgroup. Um, if, if you join it for Motherwell, is, is, does that mean it's Motherwell only or can you be in more than one group? Because uh, I'm actually Airdrie based, uh, but we work across the whole of Lanarkshire. So are you just like We're welcome. Up? Yep. No, 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 no. I'll, I'll take your name, Dennis, I'll and we'll come back to you. No, that's fine. I'll pop it in the chat bar for you. Fabulous. That's great. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thanks, Dennis. It, it's Did same. You... Sorry, it's same with me. Yep. I I missed the entry one. So if you could send me an invite as well, please. No bother. That's Thank great. You. Thank you. Agenda number six I is the terms of reference feedback. Christine, you're going to talk to this? Yes, I will. Thank, thanks, Chair. Um, I just wanted to give a wee quick feedback on where we're at with the terms of reference. Now, for, for people who are new to the meeting tonight, um, we, we had circulated a draft terms of reference to um, board members um, and asked for some feedback. So we've actually received a bit of feedback. So I wanted to say thanks, first of all, to, to all those who took the time to, to respond to, to um, the request. Um, there's a, a couple of things that were raised. One was related to voting rights. Um, and voting rights themselves, just to clarify, reflects elected representation on the board. It's preferable that the decisions are made through consensus, though, based on clear evidence and community engagement processes. And voting would be very much a last resort if consensus could not be reached within the board. 
The other things that were raised were in relation to language and terminology used within the terms of reference. Um, abbreviations, what we, we, we intend to do is to clarify and explain fully any abbreviations that have been used within the document. We will also add a, a glossary of terms to the end of the document to make it easier to understand um, and, and can explain some of the terms that, that are used with, within that. What we'll then do is, um, once we've made those changes, we'll recirculate the amend with the amendments to all board members for you to have a look, and we would hope that that would then be adopted as the terms of reference for, for this particular board. Um, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much. Does anybody have any comments or questions about the terms of reference? No. Sorry, can I come oh, in yeah, again? Of course, of course. Uh, we we haven't attended Motherwell meeting. I'm from North Lancashire, Muslim Women and Family Alliance. So what we've done is uh, uh, the um, our uh, board members with Elvin. So uh, Nasim Hussain has been nominated now. So she will be um, representing us you know, they are organization. So we haven't got any, um, you know, the term of reference that you mentioned. It will be very helpful if Nassim receives some correspondence, which, you know, we missed. Thank you very much. Yeah, we can get that over to you. Absolutely. Thanks very much. Thank you. 6-2 is the board development sessions, Matt. Thanks, Chair. It's just to take an opportunity tonight to um, make the board aware of the, the, the programme going forward in terms of board development. Over the next few months and the last two cycles of the board and this, when you hear a lot of different issues that we address at the, the community boards, like digital tonight, you've had um, the plan for North Lanarkshire, you've heard reference to the budget process, participatory budgeting, the local development programme, board governance, community asset transfer, um, local outcome improvement plans, just to name a few of the, the subjects that, are, that have came across the agendas in the board so far. And these are things that we, we're, we're hoping that people who, who attend the boards on a regular basis will want to get more information about. So we're going to be developing um, board development sessions that allow opportunities to have spend a bit more time, a bit more detail, looking at these specific issues going forward and give people an opportunity to attend sessions to hear more about these specific issues going forward. So that's something we're working to develop at the moment and we'll be in touch with you as that progresses and how we're going to do that through a mixture of face-to-face -face interaction and hopefully um, some online modules that could be done as well in relation to some of the subject matter. But it's just a, if there's any particular issues that you would be interested in hearing more about in a bit more detail away from the community board session itself, then let us know about it. You don't need to tell us tonight, you can tell us over the next um, few weeks and we'll hopefully get that included in the board development sessions going forward. That's all for that one, Chair. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. Anybody, any comments or questions for Matt? Nope. Double muted myself there. Number three, again, Matt, is the LDP, the Local Development Programme. Thanks, Chair. Um, just to refer, the report would have been issued um, along with the papers and agenda, etc. So it's just to let, pick, give people an update, the board an update into where we are with the, 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 the current projects uh, in the, the Motherwell area. Um, a number of projects have, have been taken forward, and you can see in Appendix 1, of the community, the, the, the local development program, where we are with some of these projects. Ones that hadn't been repeated were in relation to the new Stevenson play area and Lone Head Road, um, and the, the other two projects at, at Brannock and at Craig Newt works ongoing, and the other projects completed. There's a number of projects in Appendix 2, or a couple of projects sorry, in Appendix 2, where we're seeking some in principle approval tonight, um, just bearing in mind information that was raised at the previous meeting and, and in between uh, the meetings that have, that have taken place. There's a couple of projects there requiring a bit more um, consideration and in principle approval from the board tonight. So the board's happy with that chair, then we can we can take the local development programme forward. This is all, of course, is dependent on the provision of future budget, and we'll, we'll certainly make the board aware. Once we, we know where we are fully with the budget going forward for the next financial years, we'll make sure the board's made aware of that, and we'll, we'll do that 
um, b before the next board takes place. So as soon as we have the information, we'll share that with the board chair. Thanks, Matt. Councillor Roke. Sorry, I'd struggled to unmute there. Um, <coughs> Matt, I noted in here the New Stevenson play area. I had um, seen some concerns regarding the, the quality of that, and I believe Councillor Redden um, was taking it up. Do you have any feedback on, on that? Thanks, Pat. Matt? Um, I'm not aware of any issues that's been raised in that so far. I, I don't know if, um, if, if Ross, who's on the call, may have, may have some more information on that. Um, but if we haven't enough information tonight, Councillor Rowe, we'll certainly get information and feed it back to yourself and the board. But I'll go over to Ross to see if Ross has any further information. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. Uh, I'm aware of a couple of things that were raised around that, Councillor Rowe. One of them was people questioning the surfacing that was laid, the grass matting. Uh, one of the comments was that they believed it should have been laid on a hardcore stone surface, not on grass. Uh, but that's not the nature of the surface and given the time of the development, we'd expect the grass to fully establish under that safer surfacing within the next sort of eight to 12 weeks as spring comes in and the surfacing will then be, it'll look a lot better. We've had a heavy winter, so it is not unusual for players to have sort of ponding of water and muddy surfaces at this time of the year. There was also a concern raised, it was from one resident who got in touch with the play services manager about an item of a play equipment because they couldn't see the particular play value in it. And the play services manager has responded to that, outlined why that equipment's been put in there, what it offers children, and they've offered them further support should they wish to enhance the play at a future date. Thanks, Ross. Just just one last yeah. thing. Thanks, thanks for that, Ross. That helps. Um, the, the last one was the concern regarding the lack of uh, a disability play equipment. Was was there any update on that? I suppose that refers, I suppose, to the, the previous inquiry that the play services manager had received. Someone had re requested about a wheelchair swing, which we've actually got a policy put into more destination sites because wheelchair swings in themselves aren't termed inclusive play items because they're specifically for a small group of people. What has been suggested is that we could potentially look at the future at a wheelchair accessible roundabout. That would involve the purchase of a roundabout, the installation and appropriate wheelchair friendly surfacing. The rough cost to install that single item of equipment is in the region of £10,000. So it may be something that the community board want to give consideration to moving forward into the coming years, but also something that we'd strongly encourage local people, local people to get involved, perhaps in some fundraising around that, because We've got very limited budgets. We do have a lot of play assets and we need to be realistic about the level of spend we can put into all of them. So we're certainly not saying no to that, Councillor Rourke, but it's something we may need to do some joined up working with the community to help deliver. Thanks very much for the update, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Kelly. Thank you, Chair, and, and Matt, uh, it's good to see the, the potential projects such from one area, the Sarnix Drive, uh, Play Park and the Fordwood Communal um, areas, really, really important things. And, and just regarding the funding, I, I'm probably aware that last week during the budget, there was uh, substantial additional money put into the LDP um, through that budget. So I, I hope that can help in some ways to, to sort of, once we pr process it, to speed up some of the projects. And, and obviously with COVID, I'm guessing that will, will have an impact in timeframes. But Certainly, that might help. I hope. Okay, just come in on that. Yeah, so, yeah absolutely, uh, Councillor Kelly. That's obviously very welcome. Um, additional funding to that, and once I've got a, a better idea of the, the the total funding we have for the the LDP going forward, then we'll be in a better idea to plan plan what's going ahead. But we'll certainly keep everybody informed in relation to that. Thanks, Matt. I don't see any further comments on the chat bar and. I take that the board approved the two additional projects that were added as well. Thank you. Next agenda is the local outcome improvement plan. Peter or Ross or one of you is going to pick this up. Thanks, Chair. It's myself, um, Peter McNally, and my colleague Ross is going to operate the slides. Um, 
shortly. <laughs> yeah, give me a second because they, they share, but I feel better that our digital colleague maybe didn't quite do this 100%. Yeah, I'm not really sure why. Right, because I need to scroll down. There we go. That's why. Oh, fantastic. Thanks, Ross. Um, can I just check, first of all, you can hear me OK, loud and clear? Yeah, great. OK, um, just a bit of background about the local outcomes improvement plans. As a requirement of the Scottish Parliament's Community Empowerment Act, all 32 councils and community planning partnerships, in our case, North Lanarkshire Partnership, have agreed to work more closely with local communities to develop local outcomes improvement plans, or LOIPs as I'll refer to them from now on, to better address and tackle inequalities and deprivation levels within our communities. So moving on to the next slide. In North Lanarkshire, we have an overall strategic LOIP document, which is the plan for North Lanarkshire. And sitting alongside that, there will be LOIP documents for each of the nine community board areas. Um, so, for example, in Motherwell, there have been four phases of wider community engagement. In phase one, uh, there was some work with, there was some work, mapping work that went on with council services and also with some of our North Lanarkshire partners. That then led into phase two, where we ha held a stakeholder event with, in particular, local community organisations to, again, build on the engagement work from the previous phase. Phase three started to level up a bit more. We held a range of different community engagement events, including a community listening event back in November, which many of the board members here took part in. And we also organised questionnaire and telephone surveys, which allowed us to gather more information. And also, we got good input from all 11 local elected members in Motherwell. So that, that gave us a good basis to then move on to what is phase four. Um, and during phase four, I know we're having a bit of slides, slide difficulty. I'm sure it will come up shortly. But um, in slide four, uh, sorry, in phase four, we took it a step further. We formed a, a, what is a, called a LOIP working group to basically assess all the information that's been gathered to date with a view to then um, considering all, all that information, <clears throat> excuse me, and then consider what relevant priorities to, to look at moving forward and having a number of actions um, to take place over the short, medium and longer terms of the Motherwell Loyal document. And I should say at this point, the Loyal document is going to be a six year document and it's a flexible and live document. We've made a good start, and I'll touch on some of the priorities in a second that Ross has got up there just now. But certainly, priorities and actions will be based on what the community tells us over the next six years. So as I say, this is very much a starting point, but it is similarly a very flexible document. So in terms of our priorities, we have six priorities which uh, I can't quite see, but I'll remember from memory. We have digital inclusion. Thanks, Russ. You can see them there in front of you. There was, there was actually um, seven that have been identified. And again, they reflect the priorities within the plan for North Lanarkshire, that main strategic document we talked about earlier. But it also reflects other um, priorities within other local uh, strategic documents, such as the North Lanarkshire Health and Social Care Strategic Commissioning Plan, and also the Community Safety Strategy. But interestingly enough as well, it reflects a lot of the calls for action we saw in the recent Scottish Government Social Renewal Advisory Board report. And some of those actions taken forward were inputted by members of our community board and other community boards in North Lanarkshire. So we can see with the Motherwell Lloyd, we have a, both a national and a local context for taking things forward. And certainly, we've also identified key areas in the Motherwell area that are most greatly affected by inequality and deprivation. And the working groups already identified places such as North Motherwell, Craig Newk, Fordwood and Jefferson as areas we want to prioritise with some of the work going forwards. 
So moving on to the next slides, we're going to have a look at just some of the actions that the working group have identified. Um, certainly, the, the group's been working hard. We've identified nearly 30 actions already, and there's just a, a few there I wanted to mention briefly. In terms of mental health and digital inclusion priorities, we know there's some good work on the ground already from voluntary organisations and colleagues like NHS Lanarkshire. So there's a, a need to maybe map out as an early action what's there already, how we can join that up better and identify gaps as well. And certainly in terms of the tackling poverty and inequality priority the group identified, there's a need to help upskill local people, particularly people that have maybe lost their jobs or been furloughed over the past year. And certainly North Lanarkshire Council, we're an SQE accredited learning centre. And we also know that organisations like the Health and Wellness Hub are also an accredited learning centre. So I need again to maybe map out what else there is in the Motherwell area, join that up better and try not to duplicate service provision in our different areas. Uh, moving on to the next two or three actions you see there. If you can just take that back a wee bit, please, Ross, sorry. I'm still on that slide. Um, just wanted to highlight that in terms of community engagement, that's been a key priority identified by the group. And participatory budgeting has been something that's been a positive community engagement tool. And there's a need to roll that out wider across not just Smotherbull, but also North Lanarkshire. Consult with our younger people and other seldom heard voices, such as carers, the deaf community, and other ethnic minority groups that you can see some examples of listed there. But engagement will have more of an impact. It's been talked about already. If language can be simplified into plain English at all times, there's been some good work in, I think, in reducing the amount of jargon that gets used. But I think Christine touched on it earlier. There's still a lot of use of acronyms, abbreviations, etc., that can be a barrier to people engaging in the decision making processes that affect them. And just briefly, um, with regard to the last three actions there, in terms of the environmental priority the group identified, we know there's there's work ahead in terms of the Strathclyde Park development, also a new park at Ravenscraig, and we're planning some active travel sites, particularly one from Craig Nuke down to Ravenscraig Park. And it's been highlighted, yes, they're nice places to go to as well, but key that they have, they're, they're well maintained and they're places for people, particularly post COVID, to get out and visit. And there's that element of social prescription where having nice places to go to and get out and exercise can really help people who maybe are reliant on medication to get off that medication and just to improve physical and mental health conditions too. The last two actions, the second to last one refers to the priority of community safety. A, a general action there, there are others that colleagues at Scottish uh, Fire and Rescue and Police Scotland are already um, I have already identified uh, that are happening in Motherwell just now. And the last action I wanted to just touch on, uh, again, refers to uh, post-COVID responses and tackling poverty and inequality. So micro-funding of local community anchor organisations, there's a couple of good examples where that's happened recently in Motherwell. And particularly, we as a council, and hopefully the health board and other partners will consider this too, we're looking at commissioning um, community anchor organisations to carry out work, work with us and for us in our local communities. And one example I would give is the Health and Social Care Consortium throughout North Lanarkshire. They have what's called a local activity fund, which enables up to 20 plus local grassroots organisations to very quickly get a small grant to address a number of issues that affect the communities that they serve. So that's just a very brief run through some of the actions. Well, just the very final slide here, we're going to look at some of the next steps. And the group's going to meet again actually next week just to consider the priorities and actions with a view to getting them finalised at a future LOIP, a specialist LOIP meeting of the community board over the next couple of months. And from there, we'd hope to get that plan finally ratified and published sometime over the summer. But again, the priorities will always feature as a large part of the community board agenda. There's priorities that local people have identified. As I mentioned earlier on, the LOIP's very much a live document 
and will be based those priorities will be based on local needs and towards the end of the year we'll we'll prepare an annual report that will highlight what's worked well anything we have to change and any proposed amendments and improvements so i'll maybe hand over to yourself again chair but ross and i are happy to take any questions that anyone might have Thanks, Peter and Ross. Councillor McGowan. Hi, Peter. Thank you. That was very interesting. Uh, with the new digital NL system, uh, will council still be used for uh, participatory budgeting or will there be a new integrated system into uh, digital NL? I can probably come in there, Chair, if it's okay. Uh, we're continuing to develop the use of council, Councillor McGowan. Uh, with COSLA at a national level across, I think it's 25 different local authorities. This year, one of the pushes is going to be to integrate the My Account system that was referenced earlier in the digital NL presentation as the sign-in mechanism for console. That should mean that rather than people having to register and verify every time they use the system, they'll log in with their single My Account system and then it will allow each individual to take part in debates, PB votes, or collaborative legislation work without continually having to log on and register for it. So that work is ongoing. Uh, there's a working group established nationally to try and roll that out. And we would hope in North Lanarkshire that we might be able to go live in that probably towards the end of the summer. I could maybe just add, if I could, Ross, as well. As, as you know, Councillor, we've used Consul in the past is a, a, a voting system for participatory budgeting and we've came a wee bit more forward since then as well we've looked at uh, other platforms too other online platforms and indeed some of our, our community groups including Forgewood housing and north lancashire carers together have run their own uh, pb initiatives using different platforms so we've picked up quite a lot of learning which is useful for us as we mainstream participatory budgeting as a council but also picking up in the fact that a lot of community groups are starting to run their own PB initiatives, which is helping embed that very positive community engagement tool within our communities. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor McGowan. Yeah, where's our neighbour? In the issue about minority ethnic people, we had one programme, uh, it wasn't from the from the council or uh, locally. Uh, that program was from, I think it was from Westrack. And Naseem Osan, who is representing um, in Motherwell, she was involved in that as well. And what our finding was that although we, we the group was involved in, uh, uh, in running the program, and yet, uh, when it comes to who knows whom, and that was the case in the voting. Do you see my point? And that that means the organization which people don't know, and quite often the minority ethnic or organization are not like stuff. They don't work as much with the mainstream system. I mean, we are trying at the moment to trying our best to be, um, you know, to integrate into the wider society. So um, the the others, you know, the small organizations, uh, minority communities, um, I have to raise this point for everyone from all backgrounds. They were finding it really hard because the people didn't know them and they didn't get enough voting. And it is the small project which are usually at local level needing support. And they are the one who the other voluntary sector organization, for whatever reason, um, they weren't uh, supported. Uh, we, we actually noted it, that that's what was happening. Can I just come in there, Chair, just quickly? Uh, I think that's, Bushra, I think that's a very fair point. I think it's important to explain that when we're rolling out the next stages of PB, the community board will be able to shape that. They'll be able to look at what, what is important to the Motherwell area or whatever the locality is. And 
how do they want that to be delivered? I think you mentioned there about smaller grants for organisations. Again, that will be something that the community board can take under consideration. They'll have mm -hmm. a finite budget, but the board will be able to have that open and honest discussion about how do we want to divide this up? How can we make the best impact to the widest community? So yeah. I think it's an absolutely fair point you make. I think we have learned a lot of lessons about how to run these processes, but really we want to hear everyone's voices about how do we shape this moving forward so that we, we can deliver the best value to the most people. Thank you. Yeah, that's what's needed. Can I just add to what Ross said? I think it's great that you've you've uh, put your hand up to join the digital NL subgroup, and I think that's what we really need is people to join the subgroups to have that influence on those issues that Ross just identified there. Yeah, and the more we can spread that across the community board membership, then it will be more reflective of what people in Motherwell want and across the other localities. So great to hear you've you've getting involved in the the subgroups. Thank you. No, I, we are honest, we were missing all of this because, as I say, our, it's in our constitution that, you know, the organization um, is one of the objectives was, and that was the top one, integration into the wider community. Because we only then we can benefit from each other. However, we didn't get the opportunity, but this, the um, local board, I was so pleased to hear. Honest, it's a fantastic workman. I would say in North Lanarkshire, personally, I thought if it works well, um, as we say, inshallah, uh, that's the best, uh, best initiative. I know it's coming from government, but each, each council is uh, taking it differently. I don't know if that's the model. Everyone is adapting. I don't know about other consults. Thanks, thanks, Bushra. Nasim, did you have your hand up or? I think you might be on mute, Ms. Nasim. You are on the mute. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, I, I was. Actually, it was, I had agreed with the, the initial comment that Bushra G had made. And she put forward what I was actually thinking. So I, I thought I had put my hand down, but obviously not. <laughs> but. No problem, Nassim. Thank you very much. And thanks, Bushra, for bringing up that point. Very important point. I don't see any further comments on this agenda item. So if we move on to the board references and subgroups for Christine. Okay. Thanks, Chair. Um, I just wanted to kind of, um, kind of feed back to what, what Peter was mentioning there in terms of um, priorities that are coming through the, the, the Lloyd process and the engagement with local people. Um, obviously, the, the, the subgroups themselves are, are important. But they really need to link to those um, priorities mm -hmm. uh, that are coming through the LOIP. So, um, the what we don't want to do though is to duplicate any of the the local um, the the local structures that are already in place. Do you know, there's a lot of really good work going on. We don't want to have an additional subgroup if there's already something there. So, I'll give you an example. I know one of the things that was put forward for Motherwell previously was a youth subgroup, and there's already youth provision within the area in terms of youth forums. And should it then be that those youth forums then look at the, the kind of key priorities for young people rather than establishing something new? So, so really, all I would say is that um, we re we really need to um, look at the subgroups in terms of the priorities that are coming through. Like we said there, um, Peter mentioned a number of things in his, in his feedback, um, including things like mental health. We know that the digital inclusion um, was obviously something that's been mentioned in terms of a subgroup. So we wouldn't want to be setting up another subgroup when there's already one being established. Um, PB was another one that, that Peter had mentioned in, a, in his feedback. Um, and obviously that that would be a priority for, for the board as well and the potential to look at a PB subgroup. Community safety was something that was mentioned as well. Um, and again, could that be something that could be used in terms of a, a subgroup within within the local board? So we're really looking for um, people who would be interested in some of these um, kind of areas. Um, you might have personal experience in it. You might have your group or your organisation might have a an overview of some of these issues that are, that are being raised in terms of the, the, the kind of priorities. And we'd be really keen 
if you're interested in getting involved and putting yourself forward, just as Peter said there, if people are interested, then please let us know if there's particular areas of interest within the, 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 the Lloyd presentation that was put forward that you would like to be involved in. Please let us know and we'll make sure that we're including you within that. That's all I wanted to say, Chair. Thanks very much. Thanks, Christine. Does anybody have any questions for Christine? Could, could I just add to something Christine said? Thank, thanks, Chair. Yeah, exactly as Christine said, there are um, forums already in Motherwell um, that we can link into, and we've had discussions with um, colleagues, youth work colleagues who work with Motherwell Youth Voice, for example, and they're more than happy to be our main link to the, the needs and wants and desires of young people in the Motherwell area. And they'll, they'll give us a report, perhaps at, at future board meetings, to highlight different issues. And again, it could be issues around mental health or uh, community engagement we talked about there earlier on. And the, the LOIP subgroup, we had about 12 people in the LOIP subgroup who I'm delighted to say want to be part of those subgroups going forward as well. And I think, as you pointed out, Christine, that if, we, if anyone else is interested in getting involved, please contact Christine to let us know. We're quite keen to get the subgroups up and running very, very quickly. Thanks, Stuart. Thanks, Peter. And just to repeat that point, to make contact with one of the team and uh, get involved. I don't see anybody else intimating they want to speak, so if we move on to agenda number seven. Which Dan is Scott's the, raised the hand, Chair. Apologies, Dan. We can't hear you, Dan. You're not on mute, though. I think you might be having some difficulties, technical difficulties. I'll move on and we we'll can certainly pick up. Sorry, Dan, we still can't hear you. I see your mouth going there and nothing coming out. We'll move on, right, Dan, and we can certainly pick the point up. You know, I don't think. Matt, or like any of the other ones will have any issue with that. Matt, if you want to start this on the consultation plans around the town and community hubs. Thanks, Chair. It's just to remind people of the event that's taking place on the 16th of March regarding the Motherwell Town and Community Hubs. And there's an online event taking place. We did it. We sent out the information last week regarding this, and it's been put in the chat bar again today for people to who are invited to come along and join that event that's taking place on the 16th of March, half past six. Um, if, you, if you see a link there, if anybody wants, can't access that or wants to be resent it, let us know and we'll make sure that's sent out to him who's interested in joining that event on the 16th of March at half past six, year. Thanks, Matt. And I see that's been stuck up there with Christine, so thanks very much. I encourage folk to join up and see what the plans are. And I think there's an opportunity to vote as well, isn't there, uh, later on after it. So that's quite exciting. Has anybody got any comments or questions for on the town hubs, community hubs? No. Nope. Agenda item number eight is a petition uh, received. Ross, I think you're going to briefly touch on this first. Yeah, I'll come in on that, Chair. Uh, so, as the board may well be aware, maybe not everyone, petitions that are received by the council, they go to the relevant service to prepare a response report. That response report then comes to the relevant community board for consideration. So the purpose of this report is to advise the community board of a petition requesting that Core Path 281, which connects Electric Bar to the Beechwood Estate, is closed and explain the council position in response to that. The report's been submitted with community board papers seven days ago, and the report has the following recommendations. That the Motherwell Community Board should note the content of the petition, Approve the proposal for the Council to undertake statutory consultation on a proposed diversion of the core path using Section 20 of the Land Reform Scotland Act and note the remaining legal rights that exist under the Land Reform Scotland Act 2003 for use of the lane until such time as a change of use is sought and granted under powers of the Planning Scotland Act. And finally, note the additional actions proposed by the Community Partnership Team in relation to the 
issues raised by the petition. I'm quite happy, Chair, to discuss the recommendations that there if people would like some background or further detail. And rather than going through the report verbatim, I would be happy just maybe to open it up to the floor for questions. Yeah, absolutely, Ross. Does anybody have any contribution or comments or questions on this report? Councillor Valentine. Thanks, Chair. I was wondering if there's a change of policy in the Council now. Since uh, I requested this lane be closed 15 years ago and the Council took nothing to do with it, they said it was a right away and they would absolutely take nothing to do with it because all the residents of uh, Airbus Crescent and Airbus Drive have horrendous time. So what I'm looking for here is what change of policy has happened now that we've taken this on board when I was ignored 15 years ago. Thanks. Thanks, Councillor Valentine Ross. Can you touch on this? Or, could you? I can. Well, I can certainly come in. There's not, as far as I know, Councillor, been any change in policy. I think we do have an access team, and what they're doing is they're looking at uh, the provisions of the Land Reform Act. It was originally out in 2003, but it was amended in 2016, and there is provision within the Land Reform Act to divert an identified core path when an alternate use, an alternate route can be found, and when it goes out to consultation, there's no objections to that diversion. So we're following the latest government policy and the change that has been made to the Land Reform Act. So it's really us responding, us responding to national legislation rather than any local policy change. OK, thank you. Thank you. Graham. Thanks, Chair. I was just going to say I could offer a, a slight bit of background to that as to why that kind of application has come in, if you wish. Uh, I know there are kind of councillors involved as well and perhaps they want to, to cover that otherwise, but if you wish, I can kind of give a bit of background to that. Yeah, yeah. Certainly, I'm aware the applications come in because of kind of ongoing issues around about the kind of barn saw nature reserve and the recent kind of reports and things and issues that the the residents down at Chestnut have had are the kids seem to be using the lane from the electric bar to make their way in towards barn saw and then kind of coming back out that way. And obviously, at times they're down there, there's kind of alcohol consumption going on. It's a, a kind of ongoing problem. I'm sure most of us are aware of. And then obviously it tends to be that later at night when perhaps children, youths are intoxicated, the, the residents in particular then are getting kind of ongoing issues with their behaviour. Um, I know there were instances of kind of cars getting run over the top of and things like that, and perhaps at times the residents getting abuse. So I think that's the, the kind of main reason behind the application for this is to, to try and obviously kind of quell some of the, the issues, antisocial behaviour issues they're having there because of youths and access to barn floor. Thanks, Graham. I do have two further councillors intimated that want to speak, but I did have a note to bring in Kenny, who's here uh, as a local resident. So important to hear from him first, and then I'll bring in the two councillors. Uh, thanks, guys. Um, yeah, just leading on from what Graham is saying there, um, it's not all, fortunately, to do with Barons Hall. That this, the petition that's been put in is not a knee jerk reaction, to be honest with you. The lane has been attracting criminal activity and antisocial behaviour for years. Um, as residents have become kind of more connected, um, I think in the past it's kind of been the bystander approach where people have thought someone else is going to help us and deal with it. It's kind of come to a head now where I don't want to say it's unlivable, but three out of the six houses that are closest to the entrance of the lane have been sold in the last three months, um, where one of the residents had their window smashed on the night before their first viewing. Uh, another one had, as I say, it's not also with youths, uh, there was a hit and run incident where uh, £4,000 worth of damage was done to a car. The month before, someone, after committing an attempt to murder somewhere else in Motherwell, used the lane as a getaway uh, and they ran down it with a machete and jumped through their garden onto the railway. And then I would like to also come to, there was a young man who bought the house closest to the lane two years ago. Um, and there's no other way of saying it. He was basically driven out of his house by youths. He had his windows smashed. He was getting his windows chapped and shouted in every single night. Now, he lived alone. This was his first house that he bought. 
Uh, he lived alone there, um, and basically he felt like he had no other option than to sell, which I think personally, I'm hoping, I, I heard the gentleman earlier saying, why now compared to before? I'm sorry that it's not happened before because this young man has, as you're saying, been felt like he had no other option than to sell his first ever house and move back with his parents. Um, going back to the, the core path, I know it's legislation. This is not an essential path. If you want to come to our estate, you can walk down Erbos Road past 60 front windows and come through that way rather than run down a dark, unlit, unpaved path where you're running behind. Uh, 15 houses and then into our cul-de-sac. Um, so, as I was saying, I just want to give you a wee bit more background again. The youth may be coming from Barons Hall. We're not completely sure on that. We feel like, as residents, we have basically been um, victimised and picked on by them. Um, I would like to go back to, to Graham, though. The police actually have been fantastic. Uh, there has been an increased police presence of late. And I would just like to put on record that uh, the residents really thank the police for that. There's been officers on bikes, officers on foot, and there's been regular, especially at weekends, there has been regular um, officers coming through in unmarked cars, etc. So I think residents have had a bit of give and take with the police um, due to, I think, just how an, an emotive subject this is. But I'd like to put on record uh, to thank the police. Um, Sorry, I would also just like to go on record as well um, to say to thank the councillors, both councillors Gallagher in particular and McGowan more recently, because uh, the estate and the antisocial behaviour and criminality has fallen into both our wards. I would just like to say that they've actually been magnificent. Um, they have worked with us via face to face when it's been uh, able to between lockdowns, but also via WhatsApp groups, and I don't think the councillors, and I'd like, hopefully, they get a chance to speak uh, if I ever stop. Um, but I think the councillors, I don't think they were ready for how emotive uh, this was going to be. <laughs> there's, there's been a lot of raw emotions um, from residents, and I don't think, without the councillors, I don't think we would have got to this point. Uh, I would like to make another one last point. The residents, we didn't ever want it to get this far to having to put a petition forward. We have been working via the councillors with Ross Dunn and others in the council. Now, I know there are certain um, things that have to go through because of the Land Reform Act. But I would just like to, to put the focus here on the residents. And yes, we can we can replace windows. We cannot replace being scared to live in your own house. You cannot replace not allowing your daughter out after four o'clock during the week because you're scared of use coming through. You cannot buy these things back. And it's weird, a number of residents throughout coronavirus have thought coronavirus is going to be the biggest pull on their mental health. For residents around those who live backing onto the lane and round the lane, this ongoing criminality has actually got to a boiling point where it really is affecting the mental health of residents. And I just want North Lanarkshire to remember that when they are coming across difficulties or people possibly objecting to it. This is there's a large number of residents. The petition was only signed by residents who were affected. We we really, to be honest with you, we don't want this kind of spotlight on our estate um, because obviously it's all privately owned houses. It is a good place to live. It has been, but at night and especially at the weekends during summer holidays, it is not an enjoyable area to live in because of the criminality that the lane is attracting, because the youth know it's it's somewhere to escape, basically, especially those who live in Elmhurst around it and those whose houses back onto it. Uh, I did ask if um, kind of resident statements could be passed on to those involved. I'm not sure if that has happened or not, um, but I think if uh, those who are here had a chance to read them. If you have read them, um, I think you might actually be shocked, to be honest with you, because it's, it's not enjoyable enjoyable reading. But as I was saying, I just want to go back, back to the positives. Uh, the community spirit around our area that's brought us together because of this has been fantastic. The police, as we've seen, especially of late, they have always worked with us. 
lovely. It's been absolutely brilliant. And I'll go back to the councillors again, who should both be patting themselves in the back with how they've conducted themselves throughout. OK, thank you very much. Thank you, Kenny. And always helpful to hear a perspective from the actually on the ground. Councillor McGowan. My goodness, thank you, Kenny. It's not often that we hear councillors praise, but that's that's very kind of you. It's all in, all in a day's work to look after our constituents. Uh, first of all, I, I, I heard something tonight that I didn't know before. I didn't know that Alan Valentine, councillor Alan Valentine, my uh, partner in Ward 19, wanted the lane shut 15 years ago. Was that to do with antisocial behaviour, Alan? Yes, it was. It was the the lane from the electric bar into Elmhurst and all the Airbus Drive and Airbus Crescent people. And I held a public meeting. And remember when pubs used to be open? I held a public I held a public meeting in the electric bar at the time uh, with council officers. But basically, we were told that was a right away into the old Anderson uh, steelworks or whatever the works were down over the bridge, and there was no way that the that could be changed over. And I was I was left in that position that there was no way, nothing the council could do about it. And I had to apologise. That area was my constituency at that time, and the old single wards, the boundary was not the railway line; it was the graveyard. So Airbus Crescent, Airbus Drive, and Elmhurst were all part of my ward. So, yes, I, I've spoke about this years ago, but as was said earlier on there, there's a, a change in the legislation, which hopefully may help uh, everybody concerned, especially the residents. I'm not sure about the Elmhurst ones, but I know the Airbus Drive and Airbus Crescent have had hell for 20, 30 years. Thanks, Alan. Uh, no, I'd just like to thank the Council for working in the consultation and hopefully eventually closing this lane because uh, as Kenny says I have been totally amazed and horrified at what these residents and it is in Elmhurst are, are going through uh, at this time and also the lane makes it the, the police as Kenny said uh, have been magnificent uh, but it makes it very difficult for them when uh, the children and it is young very young people who are coming off the train at Airbus and uh, going down the lane and then going down Barnes Hoch and it's very dark in the lane and it makes it very difficult for the police to identify them, catch them and uh, sort out the antisocial behaviour. Um, the police have done everything in their power to, and I think they are having a major effect on it. The, the last few weekends, uh, the residents have a a WhatsApp uh, page, and uh, when I first got involved in this, uh, I was amazed at the comments and the WhatsApp about the number of children coming down through the lane uh, and uh, going, unfortunately, going down in the dark to a very fast-moving river down Barnes Hoch, which worried me that there actually could be also danger to the children going down there. But the police had plain clothes, unmarked cars, uh, police and bikes, police and dirt bikes, um, it, everything in their power, bringing extra staff because the residents were all told to phone 101 all the time, phone 101, build up the profile, and uh, then the police target that with, with extra police. So the police have done a magnificent job, are doing a magnificent job, but if... Uh, if the lane is, is closed, it will make it much easier because the, when the youngsters come off the train at Airbus, then they will be far more visible and won't be able to hide in the in the lane. So, uh, but I think there's been a lot of uh, very good teamwork teamwork through this. But um, hopefully, the closing of the lane makes a huge difference to the lives of the people that live down there. Thank you. Thank you. I'll come to Councillor Gallagher and then I'll move back to Ross just to pick up on some of the points that have been made so far. Councillor Gallagher. Thank you, Chair. And if I could begin just by thanking Kenny as well for, you know, giving that oversight in terms of what the residents have had to put up with um, for so many years. I mean, Alan, you know, you've tried to close the lane 15 years ago. That shows you how long I think residents have been fighting this. 
And you know, it's it's great to actually get to this point because Police Scotland, residents, council, uh, councillors, council have all worked together um, in order to try and get this lane closed. And it has been one of the most horrific processes, just trying to find out, you know, how can we get it done? How do we go about it? And um, you know, trying to navigate the Land Reform Act. If anyone is knows of the Land Reform Act or you know anything to do with it, you'll realise that there's loopholes everywhere. Um, and it really is a, a long drawn out process, but I think the residents have been to hell and back and, you know, we really need to, to move on to try and get rid of this antisocial behaviour, which is quite a lovely area. I mean, I think, you know, for Kenny to say that, you know, young children can't get out to play after four o'clock because they're just so terrified of what's going to happen from that time onwards. No one should have to live like that. And it's just horrific that that's what people have had to put up with for so long. I think Agnes, you know, hit the, the nail on the head, teamwork. You know, I think everyone has pulled together and everyone is now communicating with each other. And I think that is what's made us get to this point, what's made things work. Um, without that teamwork, without the WhatsApps, without, you know, being able to contact council officers, police officers, um, even out of hours. And I thank them for that because they really have went above and beyond um, in order to help residents. I think this is, you know, the positives and how we can move forward to actually get this lane closed. So I won't um, continue on because I think it's all been um, touched upon, but I just want to say thank you for everyone that's been involved and fingers crossed and let's make sure we can get the residents a peaceful area, which they so much deserve. Thanks, Councillor Gallica. Rose, Hi, you... Sorry, sorry, Dennis. Sorry, 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 on you go. I, sorry, I just had, to had my hand up for a wee while. It was just um, to touch on uh, what Kenny was saying. And, um, as an outsider to the area, I'm not really familiar with all this, but what struck me is, is there CCTV or could there be funds, uh, could we contribute as a group towards putting CCTV at either end of the lane? It would either maybe come up as evidence or a deterrent um, or a push to community safety. Um, there's maybe a reason that you can, but I'd like to hear it. Yeah, Dennis, thanks. I'm sure Ross can pick that up as well. Ross? Uh, I'll come in. I noticed Kennedy's hand up there again, Chair. Are you wanting to bring him in first before I kind of go over some of the points? Sorry, yeah, absolutely. Kenny, on you go. Sorry, Dennis, there is a there is a CCTV, literally. It's it's all linked. It's uh, Elmhurst is a cul-de-sac, but it runs into somewhere called Chestnut Grove that then runs over um, a railway into Agnes's ward. Uh, there is a, there's a CCTV there. Um, not to get into politics, but because there's no, uh, it's all private lets, we can't use North Lanarkshire's uh, antisocial behaviour um, resource, which I think by the sounds of it is going to get fixed in the new budget. But um, I, I'm not going to lie, the CCTV has not deterred anything, Dennis. In fact, I would like to say, and I, I, I don't enjoy saying this, it has been a waste of money. Uh, to put another one at the end of the lane would be another waste of money because because of the age of the children and or not child, what's the children, the age of young people involved, um it's 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 not a deterrent unfortunately. Um they just walk straight past it. it it's it's made no difference. And um to be honest with you, a couple of house sales round in Chestnut Grove were not able to go through because potential buyers saw the CCTV. And I'd just like to stress again, you're dealing with private um, properties here. Um, again, we're wanting as little spotlight, but as much help as possible, if, if that makes sense, Dennis. Yeah, indeed. Thank you very much for clearing that up, Kenny. Thank you very much. Again, I'd just like to say Ross. thanks for letting me speak, guys. Not at all. Ross? Thanks, Chair. Uh, again, it's really good hearing, particularly from you, Kenny, about what's happening in the area. I suppose just before I kind of sum up some of the things, because there's a couple of points I need to make, uh, I can assure you that as a council and as council officers, we have been looking at every possible action that we could take round about this lane, but we also have a, a statutory duty to follow and comply with national legislation. So that is the constraints we're working with. I just want, I don't want to be disingenuous to anyone, so just to be very clear, the petition about the lane it is not within the council's power to close that lane because that lane is not council ground, it's not council land, it's private property. 
what we can do and what the consultation that is about to be launched and we're going to do is about rerouting the core path that that path is labelled as. That path, or should that consultation story go through, it has to run for a period of not less than 12 weeks and we do have statutory consultees that we need to speak to. If any objections come up, as a council, the appropriate officers will try and address any objections as and when they arise, allay any fears that come up and try to have objections removed. If people object and do not remove them, that consultation has to go to Scottish ministers for approval before the core path status can be removed. Going in the presumption that we are successful with that whole process, core path 281 will be rerouted through a different route that's been proposed and that lane will then just exist as an informal right of way, but it is not council ground, so we cannot close it off. The solution at that stage would be for the residents to submit a planning application to subsume that ground into their garden grounds. That planning application will then allow residents to fence off either individual bits for the garden or just to close off the lane entirely. So it's just to be very clear that if the consultation is successful and we remove the core path status from there, the council cannot then come in and just close off the ground because we don't own it. We would then have to speak to residents about the appropriate process. I've taken advice from the planning department in advance of this and how that would work. and have been assured that a single planning application could cover all properties that border the lane. It would not be a case of individual residents having to do that for every property. So it'd be a single application to go through. And if the core path status is removed, the council's access team would no longer have any objections to that ground becoming part of the individual property. So I just think it's important to make that clear so that everyone's fully aware of the council position. And again, if you've got any questions or things that you need me to follow up on, happy to do that, Chair. Thanks, Ross. Councillor Roke, you have a question. Sorry, Ross has just uh, outlined it. Thanks. Thanks, Councillor Roke. Councillor McGowan. No, it's just a question about something that was said earlier on that I wondered uh, could help with the antisocial problems with some of the, the youth in Motherwell and beyond. But somebody mentioned a group called the Motherwell Youth Voice. Can somebody tell me, you know, what what do they do in Motherwell? Do they organise activities for that? I don't actually know that. I'd never heard that term before. Can somebody answer that exactly what the, the Motherwell Youth Voice do in Motherwell? Peter, have you replaced? Yeah, happy to come in. Yeah, uh, councillor, Motherwell Youth Voice are a, a local youth forum that are um, effectively run by our youth work team. They support them. Um, they meet. They meet pretty regularly, mostly online just now. Um, probably more activity based than campaign based, but certainly they have been quite supportive. For example, in terms of MSYP elections and other other local um, issues that have affected young people. But certainly the activities are more run by our youth work team. And Ross and I have contacted the youth, the youth work team about potentially doing some work in the schools to highlight the issues down at Barnes Hawk when that's appropriate. Because again, it's probably, we know a minority that are, are maybe tarring the brush of young people, unfortunately. And we want to get the message across that actually young people are very positive, doing a lot of good things in Motherwell. And just to get again the message across that Barnes Hall is an area that we want to keep and preserve, as Councillor Gallagher, I think, mentioned earlier on. It's one of our better green spaces. But yes, yeah, certainly we've opened those talks with uh, our youth work team to help support that. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. So the board's position now is just to agree, obviously, uh, the report, and we'll obviously hear more of it as it comes back or as it progresses uh, through the council. And I'm sure it will come back to the community board in the future to get an update on that at a later date. Agenda item number nine is the input from local community groups. And this is the part of the community board, really, where it's over to you guys, over to different community groups, if they've got anything they want to raise or discuss uh, through the board. Quiet. 
I just want to pick up on the point that Dan obviously had put in the obviously had issues with his mic, but he had put up about the Wisher community group, yeah, Wisher community board, and the Greens Priest subgroup. And certainly, is something that Mother Group can look into. Uh, no questions, just to answer that for Dan, and I'm sure somebody will pick can that you up. Hear me now? Yep. That, can you hear me now? Oh, perfect, Dan. There we go. Uh, yeah, it was uh, the the Wisher group. Obviously, a lot's been mentioned about Barnes Hawk already, and there's a lot of people who use the. Uh, um, that's Chico, cheeky councillor Duffy. You couldn't have done that in a meeting in a hall. <laughs> <laughs> um, the obviously there's been a lot of talk about the Barnes Hawk, and there's there's um, for somebody like myself who's a mountain biker who uses the area uh, a lot. You know, um, there's lots of talk, talk among the people who use it regularly, and, and you go down in there on a Sunday afternoon just now. It's like a Gail Street, but in fact, it's probably busier than our Gail Street, and uh, it's been really used. But we all know there's lots of erosion. Um, the winter has been really hard on a lot of the paths that are there. Um, and there's been a lot of talk about making this a better, you know, it would benefit so many different aspects, active travel, uh, fitness, mental health, all that sort of stuff. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the talking wish was about uh, putting a, a green space subgroup together so that we could actually look at using like LDP fund, um, obviously PB and different things like that and how we could look at improving those areas. Um, and obviously, um, you know, Craig Newt falls under that and there's a lot of areas obviously around, um, you know, there needs to be some chat, I think, with the Ravens Creek Limited and what they want to do with their, you know, the area that they're going to be looking at, but also the areas around about like Wisher Golf Course and uh, that lead up to Kerfin. There's, there's, there's loads of these spaces and, and I don't know the areas in Newt Hill and all the rest of it, but I'm sure they're in the same sort of condition that all could be doing with resurfacing and um, better signage and all that sort of stuff. So look, a group to, to look at that would be good. Um, and that, that's on that point. Um, uh, the, the, I did have a comment about stuff, uh, from the community point of view, though. But you want me to... Yeah, Dan, on you go. Um, obviously, we've spoke uh, this week, uh, Councillor Duffley, regarding the um, the fly tapping that's been happening in the Wisher Hill Wood Pump Track uh, area, which has been uh, um, no not necessarily surprising, but definitely disappointing. Um, and that's something that we hope to address. Now, one of the things that we hope to be addressing that with is the fact that we're going to be having a series of events, uh, no events, a, a series of groups, and we're going to. Uh, activities that we're using with different partners. So one of our partners will be the, the youth group that Peter McNally just mentioned. And um, so we're going to be doing a, a regular Monday night starting this Monday coming uh, from half past six um, for 11 pluses. And we're going to have the usual stuff that we always have there um, with, but we're, with bikes and scooters, but we've actually got a skateboarding coach coming along, which we're really excited about. Uh, we've identified along with the youth team that, uh, the youth in Craig Newk are really struggling just now with lockdown and, uh, and you know, really worried about mental and physical health. So this was a big thing that uh, we felt that together we could help address. We're also hoping that that will bring some positiveness to the area as well so people will be less likely to fly tip. I think during the summer when it was very busy, people weren't really doing that because, you know, it was more used and stuff like that. Obviously, as, as the dark nights are there, it's a wee bit easier to do that in the dark, but... And um, we're hoping bringing some positive in will be in there. Um, the, the plan is, is that we will actually run that group for the rest of the year. We have applied for funding to do that. We'll also be working with uh, the NHS Lanarkshire Health Improvement Team. Um, and again, we're looking at using the, the pump track and actually inviting adults to come along to sessions. We don't have time for, for that yet, but that will be happening soon. Um, and we'll also be looking at sessions at um, King George's Park, which falls underneath all that. And uh, hopefully we'll be in North Motherwell and York Hill as well, uh, once we uh, branch out and forthwards, you know, when we talk to those different groups. So there's there's lots that we've been developing so that it can be, um, so we're not, we're not dependent on either a skate, uh, a skate park or a pump track. There's lots of things we've been developing so that we, all we need is a flat piece of land. So an empty car park um, is, is what we were looking for for some of the activities. Um, and we're going to pilot that in Wisher. So when we actually find out how that goes, we'll be able to 
bring that out. Another thing, just for letting you know, I mentioned it in the email to yourself, there was an expression of interest put into Sports Scotland as a view develop, uh, about further developing uh, the area of the Bushy Hill Wood. Next to the pump track, uh, very early on, and uh, Margaret Ann probably remembers this as well, very early on before the uh, the pump track was even built, the, the, the vision was to expand that area and to improve over the years and to make that facility you know, world-leading you know, world leading in its ability. And we've already seen that it has done that. So we've put an expression of interest in that's roughly £300,000 um, to develop further at the Bushy Hill Wood pump track. And I know that there'll be uh, different things that we'll need to, you know, it's very early days, but I just wanted to put that out there. And, and the point that we had was how, how did we deal with the rubbish going in and how did we deal with the pond? It was great to see ducks in the pond that, that, that's been made there and the pond was made there for drainage. Um, being someone who was a resident of that area, you know, grown up, uh, that area was always a swamp. So that's why the, the pond had to be made to make, uh, to dry up the place for the track. So, um, yeah, I think that's something that can probably be incorporated into that plan. Uh, and because definitely that area is. So I think looking at that and then um, we spoke about another project in Wisha and said to Matt about how LDP could possibly be used for that as well in, in conjunction with that. Um, like all funding, the funders, they always like to see a bit of match coming from somewhere else, you know. So that's, uh, um, so yeah, all positive down there. That's kind of my contribution to that. I don't know if anybody's got any questions about that. No, thanks, Dan. And we'll let that run on. Thank you very much. Ross, you had a comment to make? Just a very quick one, Chair. Just when Dan was mentioning a green space group, uh, I think Peter covered earlier in his Lloyd presentation, one of the priorities that's been identified in the Motherwell area is around the environment. We would look at that covering green space as well. And the subgroup will be taking the Lloyd stuff forward, Dan. So that would seem like a natural starting point for that group. So rather than setting up a separate subgroup just now, the, the subgroup that will look at the environment issues around Deloitte would probably be the starting point, and that could then encompass all of the green space issues. So we'll absolutely make sure you get an invite along and get involved in that. Yeah, I think that's that's probably a better uh, heading and a better umbrella for it, because um, green space doesn't automatically assume that uh, active travel would be involved in that, whereas environmental issues would definitely be uh, in them that. So, yeah, that's... I, I totally agree with that, boss. That's, that's I, I'm up for that. Let, let me know. <laughs> I'll be there. Excellent, Dan. Cheers. Fiona. I just wanted to come in um, and give a wee update about uh, from a community group perspective. So I work for two community, for two charities locally. Um, so I just wanted to set my stall out a little bit for those two. Um, so the first one is Full On. And for those who don't know it, it's a charity who promotes recovery from mental health issues through performing arts. And although most of the time, and before times, before COVID, um, our groups are all face to face. They're all online now. So if you know anyone who would like to come along, they're all free. We've got singing lesson groups, creative writing groups, guitar groups, band groups, karaoke groups, quiz groups, loads of sort of stuff. And it's all free. Most of those are run on Facebook um, rooms. So if you do know of anyone who would like to come along to any of those 16 plus, just um, let me know, drop me an email and I'll be happy to send the details across to anyone. Um, the main charity I work for is Community Action New York Hill. And although we're based in New York Hill, it's not your fault if you're not from New York Hill. So we'll, you know, <laughs> things are open to everyone. <laughs> um, so again, although most of our things before were face to face, we've moved some of those offerings online now. So we've now got um, a Monday afternoon drop in for anyone who just needs a wee bit of a blather and somebody to talk to. We've got a Tuesday evening meditation. We've got a Wednesday evening kids craft group and a Thursday morning kids craft group. Um, and again, those are all free. So if you know anyone who would like to come along to any of those, please just get in touch. And the last thing we do, because we know that not everybody's online, we've, we've got a wee monthly newsletter that we send out. And it's just kind of news about what's happening in the area. We recipe, we book review, TV reviews, word searches, that kind of thing, just to keep people engaged. So um, if anyone would like a copy of that, or if anyone wants to add someone onto the mailing list for that, again, just get in touch and we'll get that added on. Thank you very much, Fiona. Just conscious some people are hand, so I'm just trying to scout about the screen. I don't see anybody else. No, thank you very much. 
move on to the input from our community planning partners, uh, the police and fire. I'm sure the police are quite surprised to hear all the praise this received tonight. I'm sure they want to come along to another meeting. So if I introduce, it's Graham, isn't it? Uh, if you want to just give us a wee update for a policing perspective. Yeah, thanks very much for giving us the opportunity. Um, general kind of good news across the board. Um, I'm not going to go down into kind of statistics and things like that. I know we're looking to kind of change it up, but uh, crimes are kind of dishonestly, violence and things like that in general are all kind of on the decrease. Um, I was going to talk a, a bit about the kind of joint working we've done around about Barnes Hall with the councillors, with the residents, the RSPB. Um, we, we saw that kind of spike at the start of the lockdown last year. It's been an ongoing problem for the last year as well, but with everybody's kind of joint working, the, the things that we can all put in place, we have seen a real impact on that in particular of late. So um, we continue to work, you know, with those kind of things in mind, you know, work with our partners. Um, we've been quite proactive recently, the last few months as well, targeting violent offenders um, and housebreakers. We've had quite a few good results here with some pr prolific kind of um, nominals. Now kind of locked up and, and taken away from the communities. Um, kind of drug and substance misuse is another one of our priorities. And again, between the, the, the local officers, their kind of drug teams, we've had some really good results in there again with kind of large scale kind of operations disrupted and detected. Um, as we go forward kind of into the new year, um, across the board, one of the issues that's kind of coming up, um, and we're going to kind of be in quite a lot of proactive work around about is road safety. Uh, and in particular the off-road bikes. I know we've seen again better weather, kind of slighter, longer nights as well, that North Motherwell's beginning to spike a wee bit. Uh, and another area I covered as well over in Bells Hill. So Liam, the community sergeant and the teams there, they're drawing up plans, working with the road traffic to kind of tackle that. Part of that ongoing work um, is that we're trying to get some land and I think we're maybe making some ground into that um, from the Forestry Commission, potentially up near kind of the shots area where again there might be an official track created and open that we can actually divert these people away rather than taking out the off-road bikes through the schemes, the football pitches, etc. We can give them somewhere to go. So really that's it for me at the moment. I say in general, kind of some good results across the board for us. We are quite pleased with the way things are going at the moment. And I say I'll just leave it open if anybody has any questions for me. Thanks, Graham. Margaret Hans popped a wee question in there about the off-road bikes up and running yet. Yeah, the off-road bikes have been up and running. They were kind of funded um, two years ago now, I think it was, the fund came through. Um, I think sometimes there's a wee bit of kind of uh, misunderstanding as to what the bike can be done for. I was on the, the Bell Cell community board in Motherwell there, and the, the question I was asked is, where are these bikes to chase these motorbikes down? The bikes are not designed nor permitted to actually involve in pursuits, so they're there to be put into these areas ideally as a deterrent. Yeah, there, there will be people that they can get and stop, but we, we can't go pursuing them. So the bikes are still there at the moment, um, that they've not been out as frequent as we'd like due to a couple of injuries to the riders, but once they recover from that and as we go into the better nights, etc., we'll have them back out. We, we realise the benefit of them, not so not only because of off-road bike issues, but we did use them in Barnes Hall, but we are looking to kind of expand a bit and get some more officers trained uh, and qualified in riding them so that we can deploy them more often and again across North Lanarkshire as a whole. So they are there um, and they will be out and about. You will see them. Thanks, Graham. Councillor McGowan. Sorry, Kenny, I've been in an awful lot tonight, but I, I just realised that uh, in the talk about Barnes Hawk and the antisocial, I didn't overtly mention uh, the input of the RSPB that, uh, I mean, they're totally working with us as a team where we're working with them. Uh, the, the warden, David Anderson, and uh, the sort of local area manager, Toby, uh, they're following very closely the antisocial problems in Barnshoch and are talking of different solutions that they could put in. And there's also a local RSPB group who, uh, you know, use the sanctuary all the time. It's an amazing green resource and are also uh, looking, you know, and thinking of solutions to the problem. 
Uh, we've been having many meetings with the RSPB. We had a meeting last night, and uh, you know, when you're talking about the path in Barnes Hoch, the RSPB have uh, they they have uh, started a survey of the area and are looking at, at major changes depending on what the the results of the survey are. But when we're talking about subgroups and talking about you know green space subgroup or an environment subgroup. And for developing Strathclyde Park, Ravenscraig, I mean, Barnes Hoch is an amazing green resource in uh, North Lanarkshire and for mental health and mindfulness. So uh, it might be interesting, you know, if some of the uh, local group could be involved in the environment subgroup uh, to see how the uh, Barnes Hoch resource integrates into the, the green space over Muddle. That's me. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure it could be taken as part of that. Good point. Well made. Alison. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm the leader of the local RSPB support group. Um, we are basically people who are primarily interested in birds and wildlife, but we are very interested in this local reserve. And so, in fact, we had a meeting last night at which uh, uh, our two local councillors attended and we're very grateful for that with the RSPB staff, which I think was very productive. Um, I would like to see, we would like to see real development, uh, not only in terms of the, the, the birding and the situation with regard to the erosion of the path and so on, but ultimately we would like to see um, good, outstanding visitor and education facilities at that resource because it is so well located for the whole of central Scotland. So any support or any way in which we can support you and other groups um, and any way in which we can work together, we would be very interested to hear about uh, and to work with our local councillors and with the RSP to support the RSPB in developing that site. Thank you. Thanks, Alison. Thanks for that. In fact, Graham, Des uh, from FIRE, do you have anything that you want to say or add to tonight? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, just, just, could I ask Graham a question? Sorry, I'm putting in. Could I ask Graham a question? Graham? Yes. Yeah, no, sorry, sorry, maybe jumped the gun there. Sorry, Dan. If you okay. want to ask Graham, you go, Dan. Uh, Graham, uh, obviously the... Um, Wishy Hill Pump Track, we have the active travel path that goes right through Wishy Hill Wood. It's used regularly by quad bikes and uh, off-road bikes. In fact, I saw the two lads uh, that died on that, that uh, bike the day before. And uh, I'm wondering, I'm just wondering what the sort of reporting levels are like when people actually see off-road bikes. Do, do, do we need to be, do the public need to be pro more proactive? And long and short, and, and kind of most kind of community areas, yes, uh, we get a lot of reports from the public about the quad bikes. The, the community know who are on these bikes, off roads or quads, but when we contact them to find out who, we don't get the, the uptake or the engagement for there. It's kind of shut, shut all doors and, and not talk to the police after that. So right. we're getting good reporting around about when they're there, but we're not then getting the support of when they arrive up to try and track the drivers and the bikes have been driven illegally, they've been driven without insurance, so therefore charges would be liable and the bike would actually get seized. Yeah, but yeah. When we arrive and we're not getting that kind of extra additional support from the community, that's where we really need to improve. We need to know who these people are and where the bikes are going to. When a, whether the off-road bike arrives or the police car arrives, the, the bikes scatter and people know where they're going back to. And yeah, we yeah. can go back within 24 hours and, and, and seize that bike from somebody's kind of property. So. We need to just work on that side of the reporting. Yeah. The actual calls at the time the police are coming in, but we just need to build on the picture a bit more. Okay, it's good to. I just I wanted to know that so that I can feed that back to the people that I meet. I speak to lots of parents who complain about it. You see lots of near misses, and you see lots of stupid stuff happening down there with quad bikes and motorbikes with uh, at crazy speeds. And I mean, you can go a fair speed down that hill. Um, and it's it's scary stuff to think what these guys are doing. Um, but again, I think, yeah, what you're saying there, what I need to 
say to people as well, we need to actually start calling the cops. We need to actually start telling them, by the way, see the two bikes, they come to Grampian Road, you know, uh, yeah. you know, you know, and actually saying that's where the bikes are, uh, especially with the CCTV there, you know, we, we can, you know, we can do some work there, you know what I mean? Right, that's all I want. Thanks, thanks, Chair, for what you Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dan. Guys. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just, I'll keep this quite brief um, and starting on the same theme to, to continue praising our colleagues at Police Scotland. Um, you may have seen recently on social media some of the prevention work that we're, we're doing around deliberate fire setting and fire related antisocial behaviour. We're seeing some real high activity levels within the, certainly the three board areas that I cover, uh, Motherwell, Shots and Wisher. And uh, there's a really good partnership just now between the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service and Police Scotland, and we're doing a sort of fire and crime prevention. So we're highlighting that through our social media as well. So hopefully you're picking up on that and sharing that on Twitter and other, other forms of social media. The other thing is our current campaign. It's our over 50s campaign. It's called Make the Call. It's currently on the radio and you'll, you'll see it advertised. It's for anyone over 50 who may smoke and or is on medical oxygen at home. Um, I'm hoping that if I share a postcard or a poster, uh, that it could be shared across the group. I don't know if Christine or Ross might be able to help me out with that. If I'm able to send that to yourselves to share, thank you. Yeah. Um, and the other thing then is, as we move forward with the community board and as we, we settle in, um, working on the LOIP groups, that I'll also be writing a community board fire plan and I'll share that with the group so that when I come back to these meetings, I'll be able to bring a performance report that will be included within the, the documents and the paperwork that's sent out to yourselves prior to the meeting, and it helps then if there's any questions or comments to be made on that. Thank you, Chair, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Liam, you have a comment. Are you there, Liam? No, still on mute. I'll move on to agenda item number 11, which is if anybody, oh, Michelle. I'm working on two laptops here. I'm just um, following on from Des there. Um, my friend had phoned to me the other night. You probably know this, Des. There was a fire started in Strathclyde Park and I think the mother will crew went down. So my friend phoned me up to to tell me, um, but the the gate was locked and they couldn't get in. So she thought I'd have a name, uh, who to contact. So she'd said another time she'd been down that gate was locked and an ambulance couldn't get through for someone that was unwell. So I don't know if something needs to be done with that gate that's locked, or maybe if the emergency services can get some sort of key thing or something they can access. They had to climb over to put the the fire out. Des, are you any? Do you know about that? Yeah, chair. When they looked at the start of the COVID restrictions, they did lockdown access. Um, at that point, we were given that somebody would meet us at the gate, so a tractor would come up essentially, and they would unlock the gate for us. We have realised in the last wee while that yeah, that that hasn't happened as often. So that is something that I can revisit. I wasn't aware that they. they didn't have access the other night, but I'll certainly visit that um, and chase it up. Thank you for that. Thanks, Des. Does anybody else any other comments for us to share? No. The next meeting of the Mother Community Board is scheduled to take place on the 8th of June at the same time between 6.30 and 8.30. And I think it'd be a safe bet to say we'll still be online at that point. So thanks everybody for coming along tonight uh, and have a good evening. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, thanks everyone. Thanks, thanks Chair.
Thanks, Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Thank you.